from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. This is the day that the Lord has made. And since he was kind enough to wake us up, then we would be foolish not to rejoice and be glad in it. So come on, magnify the Lord with me. Come, let us exalt his name together for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks be unto God. Amen. Thank you so much, choir, for your ministry in music. Good morning, New Beginnings. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the one in whom we live, move, and have our very being. And what a joy it is to be alive, to be seen rather than dead and being viewed. The Lord didn't have to wake us up this morning. None of us deserve it. But because of his goodness and because of his mercy, we are alive this morning and in the house of the Lord and we ought to give him thanks. Allow me to appreciatively applaud you for following the leadership of one of the most stellar pastor, preachers, intellectuals, men of God who understands the times in which we live, who articulates them so masterfully, who leads you with such wonderful vision and passion and commitment and sincerity. You are blessed to have as your senior pastor, your founding pastor, the Reverend Dr. Leslie Braxton. Would you just thank God early this morning for your pastor? Amen. Amen. I am so grateful to God for the privilege of knowing him. This is not my first time to New Beginning. This is my first time preaching here, but your pastor several years ago when I was preaching in the area, uh, we were fellowshipping and I wanted to see the campus and he brought me over and gave me a full tour of the campus and my what wonderful things God has done in a relatively short period of time. Amen. And we give God thanks for his courage. It takes courage to start a church. Yes, it takes faith, but it also takes some courage. It takes some courage to put your reputation on the line. It takes some courage to trust God when you're not sure whether or not this really is God, but you have faith and that courage kind of pushes you over the edge and uh, puts you to the point of no return where you can't turn back on God and look at what God has done in the life of this church and what he's done in your life. We give God thanks and thank you so much, Pastor, for this privilege. And then he's always debonair. I mean, whether he's working out or whether he's preaching or teaching or just showing up, the dude is just always decked out from head to toe. And so uh, it's good to be associated with somebody who looks like something and who is something. Amen. He came and he preached for our church uh, several months ago, uh, earlier this year, and was such a blessing to our church as he is to me. And I'm grateful to all of the Reverend clergy, all of the leaders and the disciples of this, the New Beginning Church. There are two questions that people have when they never heard a preacher before. First question is, can the preacher preach? And the second question is, how long would a preacher preach? Well, the pastor told me we don't have another service until 1030, so that means I have about two hours. Unless you say amen. And if you say amen to the truth of God's word, then we won't be in here that long this morning. Would you turn with me in your Bibles? And if you're physically able to stand, I want to invite you to your feet as we consider Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. The second book in the Pentateuch. Exodus chapter 2. Verses 23 through 25. And then I want to peek over into the next chapter, into verse, chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version as it translates the original Hebrew text. If someone close to you does not have a Bible, I ask you to be both kind and Christian enough to share yours with them. It is also provided on the screen for your convenience. This is the word of the Lord. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up 
to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Chapter three, verses seven through nine. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to place to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites and the Parasites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now. Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord our God. Chapter 2 again reminds us their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. Their cry for rescue came up to God and God heard their groaning. For just the few moments that we have together this morning, I ask you to pray with me and for me because when there is prayer out in the pew, there can be greater preaching in the pulpit. And I want to talk for just a little while from this thought, the power of groans and cries. The power of groans and cries cries, the power of groans and cries. Allow me to express my appreciation publicly for Deacon Mark and Deacon Chuck and their kindness towards me. The power of groans and cries. I ask you to keep your Bibles open. Do your best not to go to sleep. I don't want you to accuse me of making anything up. The power of groans and cries. On April the 25th, 2015, Nepal was hit with a devastating earthquake that measured 7.8 on the Richter scale. The fatalities and the injuries from the earthquake were enormous. Homes and buildings collapsed as the quake hit and rubble was left in massive heaps as evidence of this seismic quake. Beneath the rubble, however, a baby's faint cry was heard. Rescue workers had been combing the area for victims. After 22 hours of crying beneath the debris, a baby boy's faint cries had enough power to capture rescue workers' attention. The four-month-old baby boy who would locally be named Sonnet Awal, was delivered from the rubble of his home that day after 22 hours simply because of the power of his cries. In that same earthquake, another young man, 27 years old, Rishi Kanal, was trapped beneath the rubble. This young man was buried beneath the debris from the earthquake, stuck underneath it because of the falling masonry. His foot was trapped and he was rendered immobile, incapable of moving. And there he was underneath the rubble like baby Sonnet Awal, but he was covered in wreckage, not just for some 22 hours or 24 hours or 48 hours or 36 hours. No, this young man, Rishi Kanal, was in the midst of this rubble for some 82 hours, almost four days. Can you imagine? Lying there underneath the rubble, initially hearing the pedestrian pitter patter yes. of rescue workers walking through the area, yes, sir. but incapable of capturing their attention. Can you imagine being trapped and they're walking by your area with no clue that you're trapped beneath the rubble? There he was, trapped incapable of moving and because of the weight of the debris upon him all he could do was groan and there he was 
After three days, no one was walking by. No one was searching for any victims because they presumed that everyone by that time had died. On that fourth day, some rescue workers happened to be walking through the area, not looking for victims. They just happened to be passing that way. And in the midst of that, somehow, this young man, Rishi Kanal, was able to muster up another groan. And all of a sudden, one of the rescue workers said, hold on, did you hear that? The other rescue worker stopped and listened attentively said, yeah, I do hear something. They went over to the area of the debris where they heard the groan, and there was Rishi Kanal, barely breathing, but breathing enough to groan. And ended up being delivered from the rubble because of the power of his groan. Baby Sonnet Awal and Mr. Rishi Kanal each exemplify to us the biblical text for the morning. The power of groans and cries is found in the fact that it is able to capture another's attention. For the Hebrew people, it was not an earthquake that hit. No, it was something much greater than that. For the Hebrew people, it was a political shakeup that resulted in centuries of Egyptian enslavement. You remember that they lived free and unencumbered for decades in Egypt. Joseph, the great grandson of Abraham, had risen to the place at which he was second in command, the chief administrator in Egypt. He was able to bring his family, his father, his siblings, and other family members into Egypt and to give them land in the midst of a great famine. He had received favor from God that resulted in favor from the Pharaoh and they prospered and they multiplied but the bible says that joseph died and there arose a pharaoh who knew not joseph as a result the new pharaoh was intimidated by the increasing and multiplying number of hebrew people and therefore sought to enslave them in order to prevent insurrection Consequently, the Hebrew people found themselves languishing in slavery for hundreds of years. And then we come to the passage before us this morning. It's in your Bible. I hope your Bible's open and you're not going to sleep. I promise I'm not making anything up. The Bible says, and then God heard their cries. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, the power of this word grown and the power of this cry that the Bible speaks of together in the Hebrew language characterize vocabulary of those who cry out in rage, protest, insistence, and expectation concerning an intolerable situation. I'll try it one more time. This word groan and this word cry together in the Hebrew language create and constitute a characteristic vocabulary of those who cry out in rage, protest, insistence, and expectation of an intolerable situation being reversed. So when the Bible says that their groans and their cries came up to God, it's suggesting to us that they were able to use their groans and their cries to break their silence and defy the definitions of their reality. There was nothing good about their situation. There was nothing that was easy about their situation, but they broke their silence and their voice finally expressed its true sentiments that they, like Fannie Lou Hamer, were sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's what scholar Walter C. Kaiser calls misery finding a voice. Isn't it amazing how misery can put you on mute? 
Some of you have gotten up early this morning and you're in the house of the Lord, but there's some misery in your life as we approach this Thanksgiving week and misery has put you on mute rather than you understanding that if you're going to get out of your situation and if things are going to turn around, you've got to take the misery off of mute and you've got to give voice and outrage and protest to your miserable situation. And so... The Hebrew people cry out to God and the Bible lets us know that their groans and their cries had power to do something. What did their groans and cries have the power to do? I'm glad you asked such a splendiferous question so early on a Sunday morning. I'll give it to you very clearly. Their groans and cries had enough power to capture God's attention. Yes, sir. What did their groans and cries have enough power to do? To capture God's attention. What did their groans and cries have enough power to do? To capture God's attention. How do you know, preacher? It's in the Bible. There are five things that prove that their groans and cries had the power to capture God's attention. Can I tiptoe to the tulips of the text for just a few minutes? Watch what happens. Chapter 2, verse 23 and verse 24. Note what the Bible says. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning do you see that in your Bible their cry for rescue came up to God and God heard their groaning the first evidence that their groans and cries had the power to capture God's attention is that God heard God heard. Now I know it's early. I know you're super spiritual and intellectual. And that doesn't sound like much to you. But when the only one who can change your situation hears your groans and cries, that's pretty major. God heard. Obviously, when other people heard, their situation remained the same. That's why you got to be careful about who you cry to. Because sometimes you can cry to people that are crying themselves and have no ability to rectify your crying situation. God heard. The Hebrew word here, yismar, I knew I was coming to New Beginnings and I was preaching for a scholar and so I needed to do my homework and so the Hebrew word yismar <laughs> is a word for heard and it doesn't simply mean to hear audibly. It means to accept a request. That their groans and cries reached a point at which God not only heard them audibly, but God accepted their request for rescue. Yeah. Their cry for rescue, the Bible says, from slavery came up to God. Yeah, the Hebrew word for came up is ta'al, and it means to scream. So note what's happening from a musical perspective. In music theory, you learn the dynamics that the director just exemplified with the choir just a few moments ago. You learn that there are dynamics in music. There, there is pianissimo, double pianissimo, triple pianissimo, which means that it is so quiet that it is almost imperceptible. That's triple. You can't get lower than triple pianissimo. But then when you get to pianissimo, then, then you move from there and then you get to mezzo pianissimo and then you get to mezzo and then you get to forte and then you get to forte, double forte, triple forte, which is the loudest. So you go from triple pianissimo, which is imperceptible. 
to triple forte, which is screaming as loud as it can be. The amazing dynamic here is that their groans and their cries were audibly triple pianissimo, but spiritually triple forte. Sometimes we think the only way to get God's attention is to scream. Come on, sir. But the irony is that sometimes the weaker we get, the stronger and louder our cry becomes. That's why the old saints used to say, if I couldn't say a word, I just, I just waved my hand. And God heard. My brothers and my sisters, it's amazing that when we are most depleted, most distressed, most discouraged, most despondent, most destitute, that is when we are best able to get God's attention. And God heard, God accepted their request. There's another evidence in the text that their groans and cries had power to get God's attention. Not only that God heard, but secondly, God remembered. Verse 24 of your Bible. Not only did God hear, but God remembered. Look at what the Bible says. It says, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Every now and then, brothers and sisters, we can, like Israel, presume that God has gotten a case of either amnesia, dementia, or Alzheimer's. And while we chuckle this morning, and rightly so, the reality is, the longer you're in a suffering situation, the more those questions become your reality. After a while, you start out with faith. You're strong, you believe God, you're quoting scripture, singing songs. But when a week turns into a month, and a month turns into a year, and a year turns into a decade, and you find yourself in the same suffering situation, you can wonder whether or not God has forgotten about you. And in the midst of it all, they kept crying, they kept groaning, and the Bible says that God remembered God's covenant. It is not simply the notion of recall. The notion here in the Hebrew, according to Nahum Sarna, is simply that God embraces concern and involvement and becomes active, not passive, uh, to eventuate resolution of their situation. In other words, God does not have to be reminded of what God committed God's self to do. No, God chooses to remember that he can never allow humanity to put the holy on the stand as if the holy is in breach of contract. Israel was at a point at which that they suffered so long that they were ready to indict God for a breach of contract. You promised Abraham, you promised Isaac, you promised Jacob, and here I am languishing in this suffering and intolerable situation. And God says, no, 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 no. Creation never calls creator to the stand. No, sir. No, sir. Job tried that one time. Yeah, didn't work out so well. And God had to say to him, uh, where were you? Uh huh. When I set the foundations of there, where were you? You, you? you don't call me to the stand. I call you to the stand. But every now and then you can feel like God is in breach of contract, that God is not doing what God said God would do because God is not doing it on the timetable that is preferable to you. Is anybody listening? When you understand this church, you understand that God here is pledging God's self to be and to do what he promised he would. That he would keep his contract and he would commit himself to rescue his people. 
He remembered, he remembered, he remembered, he heard. But there's a third evidence. Not only did God hear, not only did God remember, but thirdly, God saw. Verse 25, I'm still in your Bible. Here it is. God saw the people of Israel. God saw. God saw. Ra'ah in Hebrew. It means to give attention to, to inspect or examine with an intention to change a situation. That when God saw them, God saw what was happening to them. And God saw what was happening in them. And when what was happening in them got worse than what was happening to them, God said, I got to do something about this situation. See, sometimes we think God should just respond immediately because of what's happening to us. But what God will sometimes do is God will keep watching until he sees that what's happening to you is now doing something inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. And when he sees that something is going on inside of you as a result of what's happening to you, then that's when God says, you know what? I, I think it's about time for me to rescue you. Sometimes we're made to feel like Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is quoted as having said to God, God, I know you wouldn't put any more on me than I'm able to bear, but I wish you didn't trust me so much. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder, God, do you see what's happening to me? Do you see what's going on in my life? Do you see how this is affecting me? But the Bible says that God saw God was not only watching and observing, but God was inspecting and examining the impacts of what was happening in them. So we know that there's evidence that their groans and cries had power to capture God's attention because God heard, God remembered, God saw. But then there's another thing at the end of verse 25 in chapter 2 of Exodus, God knew. I asked you if I could tiptoe through the tulips of the text. That's all I'm trying to do, and I'm going to go to my seat. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew that God kept in mind his people and their suffering situation. Implicitly, says scholar Douglas Stewart, the theological issue here is not whether or not or how people suffer. The issue is, does suffering go unnoticed? Does God pay attention to the suffering of his people? Whole question of theodicy. Why do bad things happen to good people? Does, does God really care? And if God cares, is God able? If God is able and God doesn't do anything, does that mean that God doesn't care? If God cares but God doesn't do anything, does that mean that God is not able? Well, the truth of the matter is God is able and God cares. He intimately knows what's happening to us and with us and he becomes acquainted. There's an interesting argument here that can be made, Dr. Braxton, that God, when it says God knew, it's an idea implicit that God learned. Now, Deacon Chuck, the reason this is challenging is because we have been taught, rightly so, that God is omniscient. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That God knows everything at all times, and there is nothing at any time that God does not know. And yet, there's something here that suggests that God learns more about the particularity of our predicament the more he examines it. 
Because all of our predicaments are not the same and the tolerance level that each of us have is not the same. And so God looks at each one of our situations and God learns how much we can take. God learns what affects us. God learns what we can handle. God learns what's going on with us and God accommodates what God learns by providing what we specifically need because what we specifically need may not match what our neighbor needs God knew yeah but finally if you just slip over into chapter number three verse number eight you'll discover God appeared it's the last thing God appeared yeah God appeared God said listen I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I have come down. I, I told you just a few moments ago that I know it's early. I know you're spiritual. I know you're intellectual. I know you're smart. And so these kind of statements in scripture aren't really moving you this morning. But let me see if there's any move in you. God does not say because I've heard, because I remember, because I've seen, and because I know, I'm going to send help. He does not say, I'm going to send an angel. He does not say, I'm going to send the heavenly host. He does not say that I'm going to send an emissary. No, God, Yahweh, says, I have come down. I going to make an appearance I'm going to show up in your situation and when I show up I'm going to turn everything around because I'm going to deliver you now listen whenever God makes an appearance God never shows up just to deliver you out I'm going to try it again Whenever God shows up in your situation, God never shows up just to deliver you out. See, that's why you got to keep your Bible open and do your best not to go to sleep because I'm not making anything up. God says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. If all you want is for God to deliver you out, then you are limiting what God desires for your life. God never wants to simply deliver you out. God wants to deliver you too. And God will never deliver you out of something unless he's going to deliver you to something that's greater than what God delivered you out of. God appeared. I conclude now. <laughs> There's proof in your Bible that the power of their groans and cries was able to capture God's attention. How do you know? Help me. God heard. God remembered. God saw. God knew and then God appeared but as I go to my seat I, I, I need to just say to you that's not what God sent me here to tell you and I know some of you have have sat there and you've looked at me the way you've looked at me because I've sought to be loyal to the tense of the biblical text the tense of the biblical text is past tense. God heard. God remembered. God saw. God knew. God appeared. But what God really wanted me to come by and tell you on my way to my seat uh -huh. Is because he's the same God now that he was back then God still 
you ought to wake up now. That means that God is not a God who's stuck in antiquity. But he's a God who's present in your existential reality. That right now, those of you that don't want your pew partner, your seat partner to know that you've been crying and you've been groaning, you need to be encouraged as you go into Thanksgiving that God still <laughs> hears. Not only that, but you ought to be encouraged to know that God still remembers. God has not forgotten about you. God has not forgotten his covenant. God is not going to breach his contract with you. God remembers. Not only that, but God not only hears and remembers, but God still sees. He sees what you're going through. He sees what it's doing to you. He sees how it keeps you up at night. He sees how it causes your blood pressure to skyrocket. He sees how it is that it affects you physically and emotionally. And God says, don't worry about it. Because not only do I hear and not only do I remember, not only do I see, but I know. You may not know how much you can bear, but I know how much you can bear. And I'm not going to put anything more on you than you're able to bear. And just when you can't bear it anymore, that's when I am going to come down. I'm not going to send an angel for you, but I'm going to come down myself and I'm going to deliver you up out of where you are. And then I'm going to take you to a place that's far greater than anything you ever could have imagined. I'm going to usher you into a place and a season in your life where you're able to enjoy the fruit of other people's labor. And you're able to enjoy peace and joy that you've never known before. And so God says, I want you to know that God still hears. And God still remembers. That God still sees. And that God still knows. But most of all, God still makes appearances. That God still shows up in the midst of our situations. And that God will not leave us all by ourselves. So good morning, new beginnings. Happy Thanksgiving to you. But may you rejoice afresh that even if the tears are still rolling down your cheek. And even if your tears are still wetting your pillow at night. God still hears and God still remembers and God still sees and God still knows and God's going to show up right on time. That's why the old folks saying you can't hurry God. Oh no, you just have to wait. You've got to trust him and give him time. No matter how long it takes, he's a God that you can't hurry. He'll be there, don't you worry. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. So don't you get down. Keep on groaning. Keep on crying. David said, I love the Lord because he heard my cry. I cried out to the Lord and he heard me. That's why Paul said, I'm not going to worry about what's going on because when I groan and when I cry, I don't always know what I'm saying, but the Spirit intercedes for me with groanings that cannot be uttered so that God understands what I need and shows up in the nick of time. That's why Jesus showed up in Bethlehem and walked up the Via Della Rosa to a hill called Calvary, hung, bled, and died. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands and guess what he did he made an appearance to the women and the disciples to let them know I still know how to show up I know how to walk through walls I know how to go through closed doors I still know how to show up in your situation you ought to rejoice this morning that the Lord still shows up is there anybody here that can testify
I've had the Lord to show up right in the nick of time. I didn't think I could make it. Didn't think I could take it. But the Lord showed up. Yes. Yeah. There's power in your groans and cries. And so join the old saints. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He'll hear our faintest cry. He'll answer by and by. Feel a little prayer will turn it. Know that the fire is burning because just a little talk with Jesus will make it all right. You may have to groan. You may have to cry. But I came to remind you that there's power in your groans and cries to capture God's attention. God is able to do just what he said. 